So welcome everybody to the BioXL webinar number 64. So today we have a BioXL use case webinar. In particular, we have BioXL HPC workflow, predictive power and its application in pharmacology. The speaker of today are three and they come from the Institute for Research in Biomedicine, Barcelona, ERBI, and they are Adam Hospital, Miwosh Witschor and Federica Battistini. I host uh, this webinar, I'm Alessandra Villar and I'm come from the Royal Institute of Technology and with me there is Stefan Farr from the University of Edinburgh. The today presenter. So the first presenter is Adam Hospital. Adam is both a researcher, software engineering and a postdoc in molecular body, uh, modeling and bioinformatics. His key work is based on workflow, on structure of traceability web server and database. Milos is a Marie Curie Fellowship, a postdoc Marie Curie Fellowship, and his research based on DNA damage and epigenetic, but he is also very interested in visualization and in force field. Federica is a postdoc in a structural and bio, a computational biology, sorry, and her research interests are nucleosid, sequence dependence connect to epigenetics also, and she has work on a DNA protein database. More on their profile, you can find on the BioXL webpage that where you have found this webinar. So now I will give the word to Adam to start. Thanks, Alessandra, again, and uh, welcome to the, the, uh, this edition of the BioXL webinars. In this case, we are going to present uh, a set of uh, BioXL workflows focused on HPC resources, and we are going to try to demonstrate the predictive power that they have uh, with uh, applications in pharmacology, with three different applications that we are going to present today. <clears throat> Let me start with a very brief introduction about BioXL for the ones that still don't know about it. It's a center of excellence for computational and biomolecular research. It's a project that started seven years ago already, and it was a uh, uh, an European Commission Horizon 2020 funded uh, center. Uh, it has become a central hub for biomolecular modeling and simulations now, and you see in the screen, uh, many of different important um, research um, groups and universities and also uh, private companies uh, in Europe are involved in the project. And we basically, <clears throat> our area of expertise is uh, 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 working with quantum mechanics and molecular mechanics with the small molecules and macromolecules. One of our main objectives is enable better science, and we do that uh, first improving the performance and functionality of key applications. And our key applications in BioXL are Gromax for MD, Haddock for protein docking, <clears throat> PMX for free energy, and CP2K and CPMD for QM and QMMM calculations. And then we are also developing user-friendly computational workflows. And uh, basically, these workflows are joining together our key application and trying to tackle uh, very important and useful um, uh, um, scientific cases, and actually we defined a set of use cases in the work in the in the project uh, three years ago. And uh, today we we have chosen three of them uh, to demonstrate the the power, the prediction power of uh, of our workflows. Um, the, the the project that we are going to uh, present today, they can be classified in this uh, data driven science in the sense that we uh, take uh, information from descriptive analytics uh, that ex explain us what happened. We are trying to predict what will happen using this information, and we are um, generating information that uh, can be hopefully used in prescriptive analysis. Uh, what we are doing, how we are doing that, is basically um, running a macromolecular simulations. These simulations are generating lots of data that we are storing and then analyzing. And with this analysis, we try to predict and we then uh, compare or correlate or try to correlate this prediction with uh, information taken from experiments, so experimental data. And sometimes data from the experiments are also added uh, to the data that we are generating. And then we are using also these data, for example, to train uh, machine learning algorithms. But what makes uh, our approach a little bit different from the common data-driven science pipeline is that we are using very in a very efficient way, and I will try to convince you about that in the next uh, couple of slides, 
we are using supercomputer or HPC facilities to um, generate this kind of data to run the simulations and um, reduce the time to result. So I will give you a couple of uh, uh, examples on this kind of workflows, uh, HPC workflows that we are developing in BioXL. The first one is the typical case of uh, a preparation of a molecular dynamic simulation, so the ND setup pipeline together with the production molecular dynamic simulation, but we have included at the beginning the modeling, the automatic modeling of protein residue mutations. This is the workflow that you see here. Uh, we build the workflow with our BioXL building blocks library, wrapping the Gromax MD uh, program, and we are executing this uh, and launching the workflow and controlling the workflow using the PyCom's uh, workflow manager that is uh, developed in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Just as an example, uh, we can launch this uh, particular workflow to generate 12 different mutations automatically, uh, produce 10 nanoseconds uh, of MD simulation using four nodes uh, in MPI regime uh, in the Mare Nostrum supercomputer using uh, more than 2,000 cores in one single job. Uh, and the final time to result is eight hours. And here, uh, and this is very important for the HPC facilities, we are uh, using, we are demonstrating that we are using 100% of CPU usage for all of the nodes uh, in the job, in the calculation. This is, a, uh, if you want a pretty uh, easy example, but, but we can go to more complex um, workflows like this one. This is a non-equilibrium free energy calculation workflow that basically is telling us this delta G number here that is uh, giving us information on how much uh, a protein residue uh, mutation here in the protein is affecting the binding of the protein with the ligand or with the drug uh, molecule. This is a complex workflow that involves running many different non-equilibrium MD simulation, a short non-equilibrium simulation, but a big number of them in the forward and also in the reverse. Um, and this is, uh, again, built using the BioXL building blocks library. Uh, it is wrapping, in this case, Gromax and PMX, two of our key main application, and it is launched and controlled by the PyComs uh, workflow manager. And again, as an example, you see how we are uh, using 100% of uh, all the nodes that we are using more than uh, 1,500 cores. Uh, in this case, with a time of five hours, something that was uh, uh, completely impossible, it was weeks of uh, uh, calculation in a local a small cluster. So we are using this kind of workflows uh, in, the, in the, these applications that we are going to present today. Um, those are the projects, and uh, I will start with this one. Uh, high throughput prediction of the impact of genetic variability on drug sensitivity and resistance patterns for clinically re relevant uh, EGFR mutations, uh, all of that from atomistic simulations. Uh, and I will, um, yes, uh, th this project, I, I, I wanted to say that I will be very quick because uh, for the sake of time, but uh, the story started uh, four years ago, um, and, and this was a collaboration between uh, Nostrum Biodiscovery, <clears throat> a small uh, pharmaceutical company here in Barcelona, and BioXL. We were very interested in the EGFR uh, protein um, because, of course, uh, you all know that this is a, the, the, this protein is more involved in different types of cancer, like carcinoma, glioblastoma, and uh, lung cancer too. Uh, it is uh, integrated in this pathway, uh, cell cycle progression pathway. So it is uh, a key component of the tumor cell proliferation and growth. And we know uh, this is a molecule, it's a complex molecule that uh, has three different domains, the extracellular domain that uh, binds with the epidermal growth factor here in red, the transmembrane domain and the intracellular domain, which is the tyrosine kinase. We knew that uh, two different therapeutic approaches existed at the moment, uh, monoclonal antibodies that were trying to block uh, the binding of the, the epidermal growth factor with the extracellular domain and the ATP uh, blockers here in the intracellular domain. So uh, for, we were very interested in the last ones in the tyrosine kinase domain. And, and we knew, and we started to look at the literature, uh, we knew that the, there were many different mutations existing that were uh, conferring resistance and some of them resistant and some of them we're enhancing uh, the binding with the different drugs, existing FDA approved drugs. So we wonder if we could uh, um, try to predict the effect of these mutations a priori, thinking about personalized medicine and thinking about giving the right treatment to the right person looking at the sequence and the mutation. So uh, I will try to make the long story, a long story short, but we started with a sequence, uh, trying to understand if all the information that we needed to predict uh, the effect of these mutations were, were already encoded in the sequences. So we started with a multiple sequence alignment here uh, for uh, different human tyrosine kinases. 
And basically, um, zero Shannon entropy here means that uh, the, the positions are very well conserved. Uh, this big number here in Shannon entropy means that the positions are variable. And these red circles that you see here are our mutations, 26 different mutations that we wanted to study. And in yellow, the mutations that uh, were uh, giving resistance to the drug molecule. And you see some of them are in the conserved region, some are regions, some of them are in the variable region. So no information for us to predict uh, the effect of these mutations. If we want to uh, analyze, if we go to analyze the Blossom 62 substitu substitutions and see uh, the most disruptive kind of uh, mutations like this one here, this was not correlated to any kind of resistance. This was a sensitive one, one that is giving sensitivity to the drug. And for example, this one, that is uh, having a mild substitution uh, penalty here, it was affecting, uh, it was giving resistance to all the different drugs. So no information here uh, either. We then go to the uh, prediction of pathology. Uh, in this case in red, you see how the probability of these mutations to be pathological in green, you see the probability of being neutral. And uh, if you go, if you see all the uh, EGFR here and you look at the uh, particular Tyrosine kinase domain in red, uh, you see that uh, most of the mutations that you uh, apply in the, in the tyrosine kinase domain are pathological or have a high probability to be pathological. If you highlight this region here, you see that most of them, uh, our mutations also are, of course, has, uh, they have a big uh, probability to be pathological, but all, almost all of the uh, uh, residues in the neighbor of uh, these ones or surrounding these ones, uh, or, or may, many in the domain of the TK, TK they, are, they have all a high probability. So again, no information uh, for, the, um, for the predictive uh, power of uh, the effect of these mutation. So we move from sequence to uh, structure. And the first study that we did is to uh, take a look at the molecular uh, interaction potentials between the drug molecules and uh, the binding site of the, the tyrosine kinase. Uh, here in the top, uh, you have examples on when we have predictive power. So in red uh, circle here, the mutations that are giving resistance to the drug in green, the uh, mutations that are giving sensitivity to the drug. Uh, these plots uh, are, uh, giving a difference in the interaction patterns between the wild type and the interaction in, and the mutated residue uh, protein, sorry. And here, for example, you see if the uh, mutated residue is uh, um, uh, generating a worst interaction pattern, then it gives resistance. It, uh, if the mutated residue is giving a better interaction pattern, then it's giving sensitivity. So in these cases, we have predictive power. In these cases, we cannot say anything because the, the mutation is not affecting the interaction uh, pattern. In these cases, all of them were experimentally known to be sensitive, so we are okay here. But in these cases, uh, in, in, uh, for example, in this one, um, the interaction pattern were, was much better in the mutated one Whereas experimentally, we know that this is giving resistance. Uh, so again, we don't have uh, predictive power for that using this uh, uh, approximation. Um, we thought that maybe that was due to uh, water molecules, to solvent bridges, to maybe the, uh, how the side chains are reorganizing. So we went to a more sophisticated method. We, are, we, were, we tried with a, a docking process uh, and uh, Again, we had uh, positive results here. This is the mutated, uh, this is a wild type. And you see here that, for example, uh, we are, the, the ligand is uh, going to the binding site correctly. Uh, in this case, the ligand with the mutated one is not going to the binding site, uh, so it's predicted as resistant. But in this case, the ligand is going to the binding site and it's much better than a wild type, even though we know that experimentally it is resistant. So uh, again, no predictive power, uh, enough predictive power for us. And, uh, finally, we went to the most uh, uh, sophisticated and computationally expensive uh, method, of course, that was one of our um, um, HPC workflow that I presented at the beginning, uh, that's the, the non-equilibrium free energy uh, calculation, and uh, we run uh, 26 multiplied by 2, so a lot of different <clears throat> calculation on all the different mutations and all the different ligands. And basically here in the final results of the prediction, you see in gray, uh, the ones that there were not correctly predicted with the interaction pattern and with the uh, docking process. And now with uh, the final numbers, uh, we have a 100% of accuracy, of course, not, not without uh, some kind of controversy here, but the method is, uh, uh, we are very um, 
excited with that. Uh, we think that the method is working uh, for this. We have uh, uh, prepared a draft that is now submitted. And of course, the next question is uh, if we could apply this method for uh, different systems. And with that, I'm going to hand over the presentation to uh, Miwosh for the second one, second project. Okay, so I'm going to start about uh, the zoonotic transition that we sampled uh, with the same approach of, of trying to see the alchem alchemical free energies of, of mutations and to trace the evolutionary pathway that took the SARS-CoV-2 virus from, from the bat variant to, to the human variant. Uh, then I'm going to explore a little bit the idea of a humanized bat polymorphism, which is a related idea that we, we formulated as a hypothesis to maybe explain part of this of the zone of the transition. And then I'm going to focus on the so-called Spanish mutant. So this is a single mutation that surged in Spain in uh, mid-2020 uh, that we work a lot on and we're right now um, publishing a final report on this. Uh, so to start to, to give some background on what everybody knows about, uh, so the pandemic, um, of course, because of um, different interactions between humans and animals due to deforestation, due to extensive agriculture, or coming into contact with many more pathogens that we used to, and uh, many pathogens that we're dealing with including SARS-CoV-2 came from animals. So for the case of SARS-CoV-2, of course, there's still some controversy with respect to what the exact uh, zoonotic pathway was, but the consensus view uh, a while ago was that the closest known relative was um, rat G13, a virus uh, that was isolated from uh, Rhinolopus affinis, uh, bat species. Very recently, uh, due to like through massive screening, they identified a new uh, bad virus that is even closer to SARS-CoV-2, which could be another intermediate. And we're looking into that, but there's uh, there's some work to be done on that. Um, and to the point, uh, in the virus itself, in the um, in the receptor binding domain of the virus, there are about twenty um, mutations that were required to, to go from the bat virus identified in 2013 to the human virus identified in 2019. And on the other hand, the receptor, uh, the ACE2 receptor, um, has about 10 differences between uh, the bat species that was infected with the bat virus and the human uh, counterpart. Um, so the challenge that we wanted to take uh, to do kind of trace this zoonotic transition is, which were the most important mutations that enabled um, the change of host? So infecting a uh, human host, so to say. Um, and we know now from experimental uh, investigations that uh, there is a preference of about three kcal per mole for, uh, for the human um, receptor. So SARS, uh, the, the human virus prefers uh, the human receptor over the bat receptor. So um, what we did was we followed the protocol that animal already introduced, uh, which was at first, and the first idea was to use the non-equilibrium protocol um, in here in, um, in horizontal, we have the uh, binding free energy. So going from, let's say an unbound molecule to a bound molecule. In this case, this would be the, the virus, but here just simplified and a modified uh, binding free energy. So binding free energy of one moiety and another moiety. And to get a relative free energy, we use the thermodynamic cycle and we calculate the alchemical, so the vertical values, changing alchemically, uh, so to say, uh, the chemical constituents of, of the molecule. Um, and of course, because free energy is a, is a state function, the circle has to close with a total value of zero. So we can derive the horizontal values from the vertical values. And as, uh, as Adam showed, we have this nice uh, theorem that says that intersection of, of work values gives us a free energy. This is a famous result from first Yavinsky, then from Crookes. Um, but sometimes we have these cases, which are kind of ugly because it's very hard to pinpoint the intersection when where this is 
320, oops, sorry, this is 320 uh, kJoules, this is 380. We know the intersection is somewhere in between, but it's very hard to, uh, to tell precisely. Um, so we're dealing with those two classes of problems. And uh, so the idea that we got was to start with the cheaper non-equilibrium protocol. As Adam mentioned already, this can be done in hours in a massive way. Um, so we can go both ways, for example, starting from both the, uh, both the uh, bat setup and the human setup. So the bat virus and the human virus, we can go both ways, accumulating those mutations. Um, and when, when we know that the numbers both ways do not match up, we can go to a equilibrium protocol, which is uh, more customized, uh, more robust, but also much more expensive, I would say, at least order of magnitude more expensive. And when we did this, uh, we found we, we took all the mutations and we calculated the numbers and we added them up and we ended up with a number of uh, something like minus 10k cal per mole. And uh, so here are the numbers where we did the repetitions with the equilibrium uh, protocol. You have the orange bars, uh, the blue bars are, are the ones from, from the cheaper non equilibrium protocol. And as you can see, sometimes they match up very nicely. Sometimes they, they're completely opposite, but we're pretty much inclined to trust more of the equilibrium one because it's, it's just more, much more robust and much more formally uh, correct when the non-equilibrium uh, protocol runs into trouble. But again, we, we still have this problem of, of having the wrong value. So what we did was we kind of noticed that this whole, uh, this whole difference that we're seeing, this whole problem, um, boils down to a single mutation, which was problematic. Um, and when we looked up uh, the literature, it turned out it should be much closer to 2K cal per mole, 2.5 maybe, uh, because people actually did the experiments and so what the, what the preference was. Um, and so when we went back to the simple, um, let's say, chemical conceptual side and look at PKAs, because uh, if you look back at the mutation, this is a mutation of aspargine to lysine and uh, aspargine to aspartate. So uh, we looked at the more recent structures and it turned out that um, if you try to predict the PKA of the residues, this, asp uh, this aspartic acid, well, this aspartate actually should be an aspartic acid because it has a predicted PK of 7.5. Of course, this prediction is never perfect, but already tells you that uh, there is a huge tendency for the single residue uh, to become protonated. And then again, doing a custom uh, mutational analysis, going from um, aspartate to aspartic acid, um, we recalculated numbers and correcting for, for the changes in PKA, we found out that uh, the two mutations combined should be uh, around minus 3.4. Um, and the whole data set that we had uh, arrives at minus 3.6 in that case. So we're kind of close to, to the experimental data for those two mutations. And we're also very close to the experimental numbers for the whole set of mutations. So for just the transition between the two species. And uh, so we're kind of happy with that. We cannot say that we have a perfect precision for every single mutation. But because there is um, some fortitude error cancellation uh, that will, some of the errors will go up, some of the errors will go down with respect to experimental, they will cancel, mostly cancel each other. And we can end up with something that is uh, pretty close, surprisingly close to the experimental number. And then we can, of course, analyze individual values to say, okay, this was important. This was probably a random mutation that didn't contribute any, um, any, um, advantage to the virus. Uh, then the curiosity that we uh, saw, actually this was uh, our friend did a bioinformatic analy analysis of the, um, of the metagenomic data set that was published for the, for the bat. And it turned out that there is a subspecies of, uh, of this R. affinis bat that has this interesting diet here, um, has two residues that are, um, Whereas in the typical bat, these are arginine and, and uh, glutamate. Um, in humans, they are histidine and aspartate. And this 
subspecies of the bat has like humanized uh, residues in these positions. So we wanted to see whether that could have already created some sort of evolutionary pressure to adapt to this local change. So we did, um, again, we did um, mutational free energy analysis on this double mutant to see um, what happens, what, what are the numbers that we can get. And it turns out that actually, um, as we go from the bad virus, like the old bad virus to the human virus, um, the preference for these two residues go, go from uh, negative, as, so from like plus one, 0.4, so it's uh, unfavorable, to, in the case of the human virus, minus 0 0.7, so it's favorable. Uh, so it already suggests that my, there might have been changes in the, in the virus that adapted to, to those two residues uh, being present in the bat subpopulation. Of course, this is uh, very speculative, and uh, it's hard to say, OK, this was the exact evolutionary path, but this kind of gives, gives food for thought for these um, ideas of maybe different subpopulations of bats harboring different uh, species or different variants of, of viruses that at some point become just um, ready to infect humans. Mm. And in the last part, I want to talk a little bit about the, the Spanish mutant. It, this is another case where we, uh, where we combine many computational and experimental techniques to, to trace the impact of a, single, uh, of a single mutation. This is a mutant that first appeared in, in Spain, I think in, here in Catalonia in summer 2020. Um, and it reappeared recently in late or late 2021 on top of Delta. So this was uh, very interesting for us. I mean, we were kind of uh, expecting this to be just a random fluke in the data because, okay, every virus can, that there's always some sort of population drift um, that will cause random mutations to, to gain uh, popularity for no good reason. But when there is a mutant that comes up twice on different genetic backgrounds, maybe uh, it actually has some sort of advantage, evolutionary advantage. So we started looking at it. Um, the problem is that the mutation is, uh, is in the NTD, in the N-terminal domain. This is the part that is not really involved in, in binding of the receptor. Um, so we tried to experimentally trace all the interesting uh, things like glycosylation, binding of antibodies, binding of the receptor. And there are very few hints. There is a small, very small advantage in receptor binding, but, um, but it's almost negligible. So we turned out. Uh, so we turned to uh, to simulations, and the same alchemical simulations that we did before uh, don't seem to favor any uh, any state, any conformational state, like open versus closed, of the spike. So it doesn't really uh, seem to favor uh, easier binding of the receptor again. Um, but when cryo EM people um, did um, obtain the structures using uh, cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, there was a hint that the B factor, so the, uh, the estimate of flexibility, were significantly higher for, for the mutant, for the A222V mutant. Um, and in parallel, we were doing simulations. And what happened in the simulations was that we started seeing that um, there is this sort of bimodal behavior. When you compare, uh, when you compare the open, um, ensembles between red and uh, and blue there is always a component of the blue that is to the right to, uh, to the red part so um, the double mutant let's say so the, the a to 22 v with the d614g which was the oldest uh, mutation that uh, spread throughout the world is always a little bit more open in the open state than than the base uh, variant so that means that the an additional mutation confers a small structural preference for more extreme opening. So it's, it doesn't really favor open versus closed. It favors more open versus, versus less open. Um, and we tried to explain that in, in structural terms. And we saw uh, there is a visible, quite, quite notable uh, difference in uh, 
network in, 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 in contact networks between the RBD, so the uh, receptor binding domain and NTD, this N terminal domain where the mutation is. And we could uh, see very easily that in different sets of simulations, the connectivity between those two domains were uh, much weaker. The connectivity was much weaker in the, in the Spanish variant. Um, so that suggested that with this um, modification, the RBD has much more uh, flexibility, much more uh, liberty, so to say, to, to move around. And um, we don't really have a good biological theory of what happens, but uh, it's just a structural and dynamic observation that we, we could kind of verify from several angles and uh, explain. And um, if there, there is an explanation one day, uh, this can be a piece of the puzzle of how, how uh, the virus adapts to different conditions in the human body. So to wrap up my part, um, the workflows that Adam introduced are um, often very useful in answering biological questions. Sometimes we need to uh, put another layers of complexity on top of that. So developing more robust strategies like combining the non equilibrium and equilibrium protocols uh, is going to be crucial in, in generating this sort of, uh, maybe black box is a big word, but, but sort of strategies that will work for any uh, set of biological problems. And we'll need to remember uh, that there's always some sort of chemistry, fundamental chemistry that we might do uh, remember about, like in the pH or pKa case. Um, then we can easily uh, generate new hypotheses uh, if we combine bioinformatic insights with those alchemical free energies. Uh, this can be uh, quite inspiring for the community to look for, for new ideas. And then um, combi combination of those methods, when we combine alchemical free energies with uh, allosteric, with uh, just multiple equilibrium simulations, uh, we can get this nice multi-angle and characterization of, of, in this case, very big uh, biological systems um, that can be easily combined also with experimental um, insights to, um, to tackle those generic uh, you know, big problems in biology. Um, now I'm passing the voice to Federica. So just... Hi, everyone. So in uh, this last part of this webinar, I'm going to talk about uh, a project that we are developing uh, using workflows, uh, DNA affinity, a machine learning approach to predict DNA binding affinities to transcription factor. So uh, what's the aim of uh, this project? Uh, what we wanted was to tackle a very um, big problem, a very big question on how, for example, here you can see in this picture, um, how the DNA that is packed inside the nucleus, and here you can see the DNA that is unwrapped, uh, how transcription factor protein can recognize specific uh, track of sequences and how they can place themselves in the, what they're called transcription factor binding site, so the most preferred site. Um, to tackle this problem, uh, it's very well known that the DNA sequence is directly related to the function, so the protein recognition, protein DNA binding, genome organization, we added in this project another layer to this uh, problem uh, that is um, thinking that uh, the DNA sequence has a physical code um, that uh, is um, encoded in the structure, in the conformation, in the flexibility, in the properties of the structure of the DNA. And we went through this layer to understand how it can be connected directly to the function. Um, we did this using uh, machine learning uh, workflows. So uh, then I will show you the scheme uh, how um, we uh, basically we built uh, these uh, workflows and these machine learning algorithm. Uh, we use uh, experimental data and I will go through the in vitro data that we use. And then we use computationally derived structural DNA properties as uh, features to uh, train and uh, test our machine learning. I added here on the right, of the screen, uh, some picture or some structure of transcription factor, because I wanted to show to people that uh, is not um, 
um, so familiar with structure of transcription factor, how you can see in pink the, the DNA, um, every transcription factor can have a different effect on the DNA. Like on the top, we can see how the transcription factor doesn't affect the structure of the DNA, doesn't deform the DNA. And here, we can see how transcription factor can completely bend and disrupt the uh, DNA. So we have to consider in this uh, project that we are taking into account many transcription factors that have a different binding to the DNA, different recognition and different effect on the DNA. So here I go through the details of our uh, schema, the machine learning. As an uh, input file, uh, as input, we have uh, a DNA sequence, so uh, coded AACG, so normal uh, nucleotide. And then we train our uh, data and we test them on uh, uh, some labels that are taken from in vitro experiments. And now I will, uh, in a bit, I will give an um, uh, explanation, a detailed uh, description of the in vitro experiment that we are using. And we used uh, to uh, train the method, see the feature. This feature, um, involve DNA properties and, and always add the tetramer level. So we divided the DNA into uh, tetramers uh, that consider um, the conformation, the presence and the electrostatics of the DNA. And now I'm going in detail to explain uh, the features and the label that we used. Uh, once we uh, train the method uh, over 80% of the data of the in vitro experiment, uh, using a random forest uh, regression, uh, then we tested on the remaining 20%. Uh, for sake of time, I'm not going like into details, but this uh, has been tested, uh, the reliability of the data using bootstrap, using uh, um, cross-validation, so to be sure that uh, we were uh, not uh, uh, biasing the, the results on the testing uh, set that we were using. So going through the details of the feature that we use, here you can see the DNA, what we decided to use as uh, parameters, uh, and uh, mainly these are called shape-based uh, algorithm, uh, is the conformation of the base pair in a tetramer environment. So here you can see the base pair parameter, six movement, uh, translational and rotational, and we calculate the average conformation for each uh, base pair through molecular dynamic simulation. And we calculate also the force constant, so uh, the um, ability, the flexibility of each base pair to move in this uh, uh, six uh, direction. Um, we use also the sequence pattern, so the presence uh, probability of each vector. And we added also uh, what is called um, a feature that is a direct readout. So uh, for each uh, base pair, uh, we described from the major and the minor groove how many uh, hydrogen um, donor and, and hydrogen acceptor uh, there were for each side, so that we could describe also a bit the chemistry of the um, base pair. Uh, I want to point out uh, in uh, this part uh, that uh, for the analysis of uh, the dynamics and the, um, so the average conformational parameter and the force constant, uh, we developed aside another wall flow, and you can see uh, it in a Jupyter notebook, uh, where it's possible to run MD simulation. And on top of that, uh, every day for each um, MD simulation, the parameters can be uh, calculated and also the uh, Force quanta. So um, we did it uh, in a project using PARMCC1, so the uh, newly developed force field for each uh, tetramer. But uh, in any case, if someone wants to apply this parameter to any other case, they can um, study them using another workflow that uh, we developed. Um, now, I will uh, describe a bit uh, the labels that we use. Uh, for who is not familiar with the experiment, we use uh, throughput uh, Selex uh, experiments and uh, uh, protein binding microarrays. I'm going like very fast on this just to show you, first of all, um, how um, using different experiments, we will have different data set and different results, different formats of the results. So for the HT Selex experiment, uh, how it works? Uh, um, usually, uh, 10 amers or 12 amers uh, of DNA are incubated uh, with the transcription factor of interest. Uh, then uh, the transcription factor binds to the sequence, the most preferred sequence, so the one that they prefer to bind. Uh, so then 
what is uh, they've been filtered, like there is the removal of the free DNA and only the DNA that is bound to the protein is taken. Uh, there is dilution, so the division of the DNA from the protein and amplification of the sequence that uh, are, have been bound to the DNA. Uh, this, uh, usually the protocol of the uh, HT Celex experiment is between four and six uh, cycle. So at the end, and usually the penultimate cycle is the one uh, that uh, is the one that usually is used uh, for uh, uh, describing the affinity and the sequence as the most preferred sequence because there, are, um, there is a selection along uh, each cycle of the most preferred sequence to bind to a specific um, transcription factor. And then there are data from protein binding macroarrays. Here you can see uh, a picture of uh, um, DNA on plate or probes, like uh, DNA double-stranded that uh, are fixed to a microarray plate, and the transcription factor with the tag is um, is put into solution, so we'll bind only to the most preferred sequence, and then for fluorescence, uh, they have been uh, detected. As you can see just from these two pictures, without going uh, more in details, um, you can see how the uh, in uh, the HT Selex we will have a big uh, database, almost every possible 12 amer or 10 amer for each transcription factor. While for uh, protein microarrays, we will have a very long sequence that they're bound to the plate, like 36, uh, uh, 46 mers more or less, uh, and. Um, there is a bit less of uh, control of how many binding um, transcription factor they can bind to each sequence. For this, uh, one of the um, uh, methods that we had to implement in our workflow was the processing of the data to have a sort of database uh, that uh, uh, was a kind of uh, um, unified independently on the uh, data that uh, we were using as input. So I'm going like very briefly for UPBM, universal PBM, as I say, are 36 MERS. So what we needed to do was to align them and using positioning weight matrix uh, we, uh, and we of the highest uh, uh, affinity sequences, uh, we could trim them uh, so not to have long sequences where more uh, multiple binding factor could uh, bind. And we also saw that for UPBM, there was an overrepresentation for some cases more than the 99% of low affinity binding site. So to have uh, um, um, more equal like uh, um, data set to train with, we had to use like a sort of, uh, we had to, use, to remove some uh, um, low affinity binding site. So we did an undersampling mainly to remove the noise. Uh, then we used uh, as data a GCPBM that are uh, protein binding macroarrays on genomic sequence. These sequence are already centered. The transcription factor binding sign is already at, in the middle. Uh, the only thing that we had to do for this uh, data was to remove uh, um, the possible multiple binding side because having low variability on the sequence, sometimes we had sequences which uh, uh, we didn't know if the data of uh, high affinity was given by a very good sequence of the or the binding of uh, um, multiple uh, proteins. So we just remove the sequences that had a uh, very um, the repetition of pattern. For HT Selex, we just did uh, like a statistical uh, um, quality assessment. We remove data with low p-value, uh, and uh, we filter cases using the correlation. Uh, when uh, we saw that there were cases in which uh, um, passing from, for example, uh, cycle four, five, or six, uh, the counts on the most preferred sequence that we found in the six cycle were dropping in the fifth. So we had to uh, check data, and uh, you will see in the next in the, the results that we call um, I will call them HT Selex filtered. Uh, basically, when we filter for um, uh, data that uh, were not consistent, so we thought that maybe there were some problem in uh, the experiments. So I'm showing you the results now. Uh, we use the, we have the results for the three different set that we use. Uh, GCPBM with genomic sequence, uh, we had uh, only three cases, and as I say, the variability of the sequence is kind of low and uh, the sequence are very well centered. Um, so we had a very uh, good uh, um, R uh, squares that is between the experimental and the uh, predicted uh, uh, values of affinity. And as you can see here, we could uh, match um, mainly the uh, experimental data. 
uh, a bit more difficult was to um, use uh, UPBM data, as I say, longer sequence and uh, uh, more variability among different uh, families. Um, and here you can see for each families that uh, we consider in total, we used uh, around uh, 60 cases that uh, we had uh, protein binding macrorays on mice data. Uh, but we could get uh, R square with uh, um, R square of around 0 0.70. And to check uh, if uh, our method uh, was um, kind of uh, um, good compared to the other that are already been uh, published, we compare uh, the um, uh, our R square, so is the last one, the N affinity, with all the cases that uh, we used. Uh, with uh, on the first of all, I want to say that uh, we compare them with on the same data set and on the same transcription factor uh, to be consistent. Uh, so we compare them with methods that have been already developed based on shape like ours, so machine learning and using shape conformation. Uh, we check on a deep learning method and a neural network method. And as you can see here, we saw an improvement using our workflow and using uh, our um, algorithm. So we were quite happy. So we check also for the data set of HT Selex. Uh, here I'm showing like a few cases and um, with the arrow, I'm showing you that uh, we are taking the values uh, from the fifth cycle of the um, uh, HT Selex selection because in literature have been uh, tested that is the one with the, high, with, uh, the best variability between high uh, affinity sequence and lower. And here you can see that we have um, standard um, average value between the R square of our results around 0 0.7. So also for the data set, uh, we could uh, um, have a good correlation between the prediction and experimental values. And uh, as I said before, we also added this filter when the data were not consistent among the different cycles. And we saw that in this way, we could uh, delete uh, some outliers that probably are not given by our um, method, but uh, by the data that uh, we are using. Um, we compare uh, this um, uh, HT select uh, as our data uh, using always the same cases and the same protein uh, with uh, um, algorithm that is uh, um, shape-based. And we saw that we had an improvement using our uh, method. Um, we also, like uh, this is the last point, uh, we also tried to um, tackle a very, uh, like it's kind of difficult and is one of the problem that has been tackled like, lately with uh, deep learning and uh, a rare network is to train the data on um, uh, one data set, so HT Selex, and then to use this knowledge on other data set like UPBM. So uh, it's a, a very difficult challenge because as I said before, are different experiments, different conditions, and uh, the length of the sequence is very different. So uh, we did it uh, for uh, all the cases in which we had HT Selex and UPBM data. And uh, we saw that compared to other methods, we could have like on average, we uh, had a uh, uh, better uh, results, but these are just, uh, uh, we will have to train on uh, more cases probably. Uh, so to conclude uh, this part uh, of the webinar, uh, we saw that using our machine learning, we were able to predict experimental uh, transcription factor DNA affinity, usually with a correlation of 70%. Only GCPBM, uh, I showed that as a higher um, score. Uh, our method can be applied to different uh, experimental techniques. And now we are also improving on passing from one data set to the other using the same training. And uh, I cannot, uh, like, we had also one example of uh, using a train model on in vitro data and apply them to in vivo prediction. And we saw that, uh, like, uh, you're not showing the results, but uh, we want to extend them to the whole genome and to uh, to be able to predict the in vivo transcription factor binding site. And for a few cases that uh, we are studying right now, we saw that there was uh, a good um, outcome. So we are uh, kind of confident on uh, what uh, uh, the results are um, giving us on this uh, workflow. So I would like to thanks, first of all, uh, 
the Modest Horoscope for the three project. Uh, so I'm not going like for each name, but here are the three boxes for the three parts of the webinar that we presented. Uh, so we want to thank uh, people from uh, our uh, lab and all uh, the collaborators in uh, for this uh, project. So here are people from the lab and thank you for uh, listening. So now if it's a, a time for question, I will uh, join Adam and Miwash and uh, any question uh, um, we are ready. And thank you for listening. Thanks for the talk, the three of you. It was really interesting. Yes, yeah, so now we have the Q and A's. If you have any questions, uh, you can type them into the Q and A box. Uh, so now I just go through our current questions we have. So first one is for uh, Milosh, which is, did you take into account post translational modifications in any of these structures? So I think this was referring to the like about the SARS CoV. That's a good question. I think for the for the small systems uh, which are concerned with binding of the uh, of the receptor binding domain to the receptor itself, we don't because it's a, an isolated system where we just look at single domains. Whereas for the big system uh, in which we studied the we studied the uh, impact of the single limitation, we had both a structure with the glycans and without the glycans, and that's gave us uh, a confidence that, we, that the effect that we saw was observed in both. Uh, it was an interesting uh, uh, experiment also to compare glycosylated and non-glycosylated uh, spike. So if that answers the question, I hope it does. I mean, we didn't explore other ones, except for obviously there are disulfide bridges, which are uh, a sort of pain in the neck for COVID researchers, because there are just so many in the spike, and many of them are in regions that are uh, disordered and do not do not appear um, in the crystal structures of the cryom. So if you're simulating a spike, always check your disulfide bridges. That's my uh, that's my suggestion. <laughs> uh, this is a not, not a second question for you, which is uh, so a two part bit. So is the obtained value of three kilocals per mole the difference of the sum of all of the RAT G13 to SARS CoV2 mutations. Yes. And then the second bit is to what mutation corresponds to the minus 9.5 kilocals per mole? Uh, so, yes, the first part was actually they did, uh, I don't remember if that was BLI or just uh, good old, uh, um, what's, what's the name of the technique that I forgot? Uh, SPR, where they basically got got the affinities of, of the uh, of many variants like many animals and many viruses and uh, that was the experimental value and of course this is the value that we reproduce with the sum of all mutations whereas the mutations were accumulating so it's not that we just did all the single point mutations we just accumulated the uh, mutations one by one and the last question to which mutation the nine, minus 9.5 9 k copper mole value correspond uh, I'm almost, uh, well, the problem is we have an internal numbering that doesn't match the original numbering. And I think it was the 501. Uh, maybe Adam can confirm this because we're looking at this. Uh, the 501, which was kind of interesting. I think it was this one. I'm almost certain I can, I can double check that later. Uh, but the 501, which was found in many variants going back to, uh, I'm not sure if it was going back or just changing to other other uh, amino acids, but it was a very interesting position uh, in general, also for for further evolution of SARS-CoV-2 uh, in humans. Oh, so there was actually there was a follow up question to your the earlier one, which you answered, which was from Yasser, which is, did you see a difference between the system with and without the glycans? Uh, yes, there are, uh, there's even a paper, I think it's still a preprint, that actually look at the uh, opening of the RBD uh, with and without the glycans. And we kind of saw the same. Uh, I'm trying to remember now exactly which was the direction of the effect, but uh, I think the glycans were stabilizing uh, the distinct state. So like 
with the glycans, the uh, open state is more stable, more stably open, and the closed is more stably closed. Whereas if you get rid of the glycans, they can they there's a, more like a continuum. Of course, not not a, a perfect continuum, but they're more like uh, the bar. I think the barrier just goes down. Um, Okay, thanks. Uh, so a question for Adam from uh, Prasant, which is, are there any BioBB workflows available for protein ligand alchemical non-equilibrium simulations? Can you suggest the best way to find pairs of ligands from a group of ligands that can be taken for the non-equilibrium simulations? That's a very good question. The answer is not yet. Uh, we know that uh, there's a lot of people interested in that, especially pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so we have uh, one of our partners in BioXL is the developers of the PMX software. They are helping us. And together with Nostrum Biodiscovery, again, we are trying to build this workflow of protein ligand and chemical uh, non-equilibrium simulation with the building blocks. Uh, it will be there uh, soon, but it's not ready yet. I cannot comment on the second part because uh, I'm still you know, trying to familiarize with uh, this particular uh, way of running the non equilibrium simulations. But we are working on that. Cool, thank you. Uh, so that's all the questions from uh, everyone so far. Uh, I have a question for uh, Federica, which is in the, the feature set bit, you mentioned you use the the DNA flexibility parameters, and that's from MD simulations. Is that something you calculate during the sort of the training protocol when you take your DNA sequence? Do you run the MD simulations or do you look these up from like the database of existing previous things that people have done? We have uh, already a database on uh, for each uh, tetramer, so for each uh, base pair in a tetrameric uh, environment, and for uh, each uh, possible tetramer we have in this uh, project that was done in uh, uh, Modesto's okay. group, uh, we had uh, the average values and the matrix six per six, like of all the possible uh, um, force constant. So it's a database that uh, is stored, is available, and uh, uh, can be used for this analysis. Cool, thanks. So I think that's everything. So I will hand back to Alessandra and she can um, introduce our next webinar. Yeah, I have also a following question for Federica, and then I will introduce all the webinar. Maybe in the meantime, I, I share my screen. Um, so my question is, uh, you choose a specific parameter to describe your structure. Uh, so did you, and these are local parameter, geometrical local parameter. Did you also look to more global property? Or it was not possible since you are looking for to Tetramer, so you have only information so I don't know how is your database, is your database, I think the tetramer are inside a longer DNA. Yeah, yeah. so um, first of all, when we check like uh, for this problem, when we want to like uh, study transcription factor binding side, we have to take into consideration that usually the binding site that uh, is occupied by transcription factor is between 12, eight base pair. So we can like extend to a bigger stretches. So we have to go very local for this. We added all the electrostatic, the hydrogen uh, bindings, the hydrogen bonding, because we had to study specifically a very short uh, stretch. Um, like uh, then obviously this, uh, we use like tenamer and we use the overlapping tetramers. So we study locally, but we can study like a big uh, stretch of uh, DNA, like uh, we are implementing on the full uh, human genome. But so we you were not global. looking more global like curvature, DNA no. curvature. You didn't consider, I mean, it's, oh, I was just curious. No, you... for no, not for now. Like we had other projects that uh, are running, like, for example, that involved the nucleosome. So there we have to consider uh, like properties that are longer on the curvature. But uh, for transcription factor also, because they bind in a very different way, each transcription factor. So we went for very local uh, properties. Yeah, and did you see some issue? I think sometimes artificial fashion have a um, um, cooperative effect in their binding. Yes. Did you face this uh, in your approach? Did you, yeah, how this is go so, together with your approach? That is so also. We, we saw that there were some cases in which uh, we had uh, like, um, 
uh, dimers binding that obviously was reflected in higher fluorescence and higher uh, affinity, but was not given by the binding of one transcription factor, but maybe multiple transcription factor. So we look for patterns in the sequence and we remove those cases. So we had- Okay, uh, so you had you the screening of those. Yeah, things. we had the screening. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, so there is like, um, one other thing that we wanted to develop is to see, for example, we have one particular case in which we don't know why as very high affinity for sequence that for us are not very good. So what we think is that in solution or something there is like a cooperative effect or something, but uh, it's something that we can implement and we can add it uh, further on. But for now we check only mono like uh, one transcription factor binding side because uh, like, is a like there, there is a big variety of transcription factors. We wanted to, for now, having the most general one also um, with the post process, pre processing of the experimental data. But okay. yeah, that we will take into account for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thank you, everybody, Federica, Milos, and Adam. Thank you for the nice talk. And I want just to mention the following up webinar. So next week, this is a period with a lot of webinars. <laughs> Next week, we will have the student webinar. That is a peculiar webinar where three students that had participated to the remote BioXL school will present their research. This student had been selected for the best poster. So please come and listen to their research results. And then we have a following up the week after the 10th of May, we will have a webinar that is also connect of use case development in BioXL. In this case, we will, there will be Dimitri Morozov and um, Mirko Paulika that they will speak about QMM simulation of fluorescence protein and proton dynamics and it's covering Chromax, CP2K, CPMD. And I thank you again, the speaker, and I thank you for the attendee for the attendance and see you next time.